But, uh, but hopefully today, uh, I want to cover a couple topics uh, pertaining to killer apps that save lives. Um, but on that note, um, here's, let's see, topics. All right. Um, and so when we were asked to talk about this, um, one of the hardest challenges I had was thinking about uh, well, what are the killer apps that we're, we're looking at? What are the programs? What are the, uh, what, you know, what do I want to say the latest and greatest? Uh, but that was actually the wrong way to think about it. Um, what's really uh, amazing is not necessarily the, the fanciest new things being developed, but how people are finding clever ways to use what's already out there in a coherent and, and strategic way uh, for their programs and, uh, and you know, the, uh, uh, the coolest thing is not necessarily the, the iPhone, you know, 4S that are out in the field, but how they're finding new ways to use the old Nokia 1100. Um, and so I, I tried to change it a bit. Uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of uh, Rob and uh, Greg who are going to talk about uh, OpenStreetMap and Yushiki, which are two, uh, two platforms that we think are awesome and we teach regularly. Um, but I, I think this is more about uh, technology application as a verb uh, and not a noun. And so the idea being, what are the, what are the killer ways to apply uh, technology? Pardon the, uh, the back and forth. Um, and, the other, which, uh, which, and on that note, um, one of the problems that we have at Tech Change is that we, how we learn to use technology is, is broken, or at least we think it is. I mean, technology is moving really fast. The idea that you, know, you become an expert in something and you do that for the rest of your life, those days are over. Uh, get to this later. But anybody here studying hard skills, GIS, Stata, awesome. Okay, so the underlying principles are going to be are going to be sound and are going to be important, obviously. But but the technology is going to change a dozen times, and, and the programs you're using today probably won't exist uh, a couple years from now. And so and that's important because we have to keep pace. And right now, there's not a good way to do that. Uh, you know, there's there's forums, there's there's YouTube videos, uh, but you, the, the quality is a mishmash. You never know. Um, and so for for us, I mean, our philosophy is that. Uh, social, interactive, online learning platforms can help. I know that's a, a mouthful, but each of those have a, a core point in our, uh, in our philosophy that I'm hoping to cover. Um, the first time I started giving this talk, uh, uh, Greg played the link know that, uh, that it, it sucks. Uh, I, I was talking all about tech change and technology and all this other great stuff. Uh, and he said, well, no, you know, uh, talk about your background. I mean, Rob, Rob is a hardcore programmer. He, he knows really what he's doing. I kind of, I backed into this field. Uh, not because, uh, uh, not because of, of, of tech skills, but because I saw the need and I realized that this is where I needed to be. So I was hoping to kind of bring some of my own experiences in uh, coming, out of, uh, coming out of school and learning and working about ways that I saw technology being applied in, in effective ways and then kind of use that to go to the, uh, the online platforms. So uh, it's a little bit of a meandering journey, but we, we get there. Um, so anyway, killer application, I kind of covered this. It's not, it's not really about the application itself. It's about the how you apply it. Uh, any students in here? Every, all students in here. Is that, okay. Um, I heard an old joke that I like to uh, keep near and dear to my heart, which is uh, uh, when you finish your, your BA, you think you know everything. Uh, when you finish your MA, you realize you don't know anything. And then when you finish your PhD, you realize nobody else knows anything either. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how true that is. I, I, I stopped at the MA. Um, but, I, but I thought it's appropriate. Is it, is it uh, yes? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I thought it's appropriate because I, I think it applies to technology as well, which is, uh, you know, there's this, there's this dangerous idea that, that there's, um, that, that technology experts are the one who handle tech and the rest of us just worry about other stuff. Uh, and that's nonsense. I mean, you know, expertise is important, and, and familiarity and skill, and there's no, there's no replacing those. But oftentimes when I hear that, it's, a, it's an excuse for laziness, for not going out and learning how to use something, and learning how, something, how somebody else is using something. And so um, I, I just think that, that that kind of nicely applies. And I think, I mean, for PhD, I imagine the same sort of lifelong learning, you know. Well. You know everything for about a week, and then you're out of your computer. A dinosaur. It's a, it's a week. That's a week longer than people graduating our classes. So that's. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad to know. Um, so anyway, when I when I finished uh, when I finished my BA uh, at St. Mary's, uh, I got a I got a job in uh, in Ramallah in the West Bank, uh, doing uh, NGO coordination uh, for an organization called IDA, the Association of International Development Agencies, and uh, it has a it was a three person staff and I was a third person. Uh, it had next to no money um, and. Uh, and we had this, this massive mandate of coordinating logistics for international NGOs who were operating in the area. The idea being that, uh, you know, even though oftentimes they're competing against each other for funding or whatever, you need to know, like, has there been a violent incident? Do I need to know, you know, what's going on in this area? Is this road closed? Uh, as a way of just, you know, coordinating activities and finding ways to get your job done. And uh, it was a great and hectic job, but I got there and they said, okay, we've got good news, which is we're now getting these daily reports from UNSCO saying that, okay, this has happened, that's happened, you know. Uh, and it's great. The problem is that nobody has email. 
Um, so, you know, like people have email, but they get those emails after they've already left to go to the field. You know, they're already on the way. Uh, and this was the days before everybody had, you know, Blackberries and iPhones and all the you know, data plants. Uh, and even text messages, te you know, mass text solutions that we're going to look at weren't really available in the same cheap, scalable way that they are today. Um, and so we, we looked at a bunch of different solutions, and I had like a week to figure this out. Like it was like, hi, welcome, problem. Uh, so uh, so we, uh, we, we put our heads together and we realized, well, everybody's got a cell phone. Um, and everybody's right now, their solution is to call us. And the problem is, is that an incident happens and we get 50 calls and everybody's pissed. And so, you know, we can do a phone tree, which is great, except it only works until you get to the, the next ladder. Um, or our high-tech solution, answering machine. <laughs> so we, uh, we, it wasn't actually a physical answering machine. We set up a voice drop box where we updated the status. And we basically said, like, updated, 3.30 p.m., April 14th. You know, this road closed, port's here, blah, blah, blah. And you try to fit as detailed a report as you can in two minutes. And then people could leave a message where they can give an update and be like, yeah, you're wrong. I'm sitting here right now. This road is definitely closed. Um, but, it, but it changed it so that when you had a three-person office, you're not spending your whole day apologizing to people on the phone. It sucks. Uh, you know, everybody's mad. Everybody, all, all the projects are, are uh, you know, important for, for saving lives and, and getting there in time. And there's nothing quite like... Uh, constantly apologizing to ruin your day after day after day. Ports of the voicemail took care of that, um, which was great. Uh, the second job I had after that was uh, was working at uh, IFAS, uh, doing election monitoring. And uh, at the time, this was 2006, so it uh, date, dates me a little bit, but uh, the uh, elections were, were the first time Hamas was running a party and Fatah was running a party, and all of the experts said Fatah was going to win by a landslide, all the polling was showing it, um, and that, you know, this was, this was you know, a, a done deal. Uh, I mean, they, they actually got a chance to write the rules for the election, and they tried to skew in their favor. Uh, the problem is they did a terrible job, and they actually weren't running as, as, a, as a political party to actually take advantage of the rules that they themselves had set. And the problem was that Hamas was. Uh, so Hamas was running one candidate for one seat, Fatah was running between four and eight. Um, so they were splitting their votes pretty effectively. And, uh, and we, we did this because we... You know, we didn't look at our fancy polls. We had a guy from IRI basically tell us, done deal, you know, don't even bother. I, mean, I know it's going to be, I've done 20 of these elections. Um, but we did something different. We actually went to the Palestinian Election uh, uh, Commission and said, okay, well, tell us how this works. You know, we've, we've got a copy, but, you know, break it down for us. Uh, and they gave us some local insight. And then we, you know, talked to our local partners and they said, oh, by the way, those polls that everybody was using, those are also off because they're, they're actually, they're oversampling in, in metropolitan centers. You know, all, 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 the, all the Hamas guys are coming in from the villages and these areas, and, uh, and they're, not, they're not taking account of it. So, you know, we, we went out, we, we didn't even do the high expensive stuff that everybody else was doing. Uh, we, we went out and asked people. And, uh, and the net result is uh, we built a model. And we predicted that there was almost certainty that, that Hamas was going to win, given the current, you know, and after we adjusted the polls for what we perceived as the bias for the sampling, and then after we, we ran a, basically ran a mock model election uh, using the rules that, that had been set, there were like 95% chance, 99% chance, like, you know, unless something changes, Hamas wins this. Now, what did that model look like? Uh, we built it in Excel, um, which, you know, isn't in your database, it's just a spreadsheet. We had, I had an analytics tool pack left over from undergrad. This is just the output sheet that doesn't even look good, and it's not even complete. Um, but, uh, but the main problem is that we, again, it's a problem. We had no money. Uh, the expertise was, was, I think, also two or three-person office, and I was, I was a new guy, so it was on, uh, it was on me. Um, but, uh, but the idea was also just, you know, you can build a simple model using the tools that you have, and as long as, as, long as you're trying to be you know, strategic about it, you can actually kind of get a shortcut around a lot of the more expensive, fancy stuff. It's not going to replace it. And that expensive stuff you've done well can kick your butt. Um, but, it, but it's not a, it basically, you can figure it out and do a pretty darn good job. Um, and so, um, and then after that, uh, so this is the last one, and then you're, you're done with my, my resume. Um, but uh, I went to the U.S. Institute of Peace, and they had a, a similar challenge, which is they, uh, one, of the, one of the big things that they do is convene. They bring in experts from all over, and they have these conferences and these workshops, and they try to get everybody to meet each other. Um, and the problem that they had is that these are expensive to do. I mean, even if they're, they're high value, you know, you're bringing in people and your audience is limited to the number of people in the room. And so they wanted to do online events. And one of the things that we did there was we tried to do, you know, uh, uh, webcasting, Twitter chats, you know, tried to create questions from the audience. And, uh, and uh, we basically kind of shoehorned it together. We had cheesy little ads at the bottom of Ustream when we first did it a couple times, uh, which was very, very bad. Um, and, uh, and a couple other uh, uh, issues, but we kept iterating. And finally, it's, it's now part of their standard practice where they, they webcast their events, they take questions from the online audience, even video questions. But again, it doesn't require that much. This is a picture of that event you just saw. It's in the back. 
This is literally Google Maps and Google Deck. Uh, that's that's what's running the whole thing. That you know is is the global online conversation. And same thing. These are both free tools. All it requires is a little bit of discipline, a little bit of thinking ahead, and then as good execution as you can muster with what you got. And so anyway, these these aren't specifically you know looking at saving lives, but these are just sort of how we think about technology. And this this at Tech Change and also how I kind of ended up there. So on that note. Yeah, it's not simply about how shiny your tech is, it's how you use it. Holistic approach required for good implementation, and, uh, and oh, and this is the part, you know, keep learning uh, out there and who's, it's out there and who's working on neat stuff. Uh, and it's as much about who you're working with as it is what. Uh, it's not just about, like, researching a cool tool, it's actually about, you know, a conversation you have at a bar and someone's like, who we should use? Uh, and, and, and often they're right, uh, if, if it's still a good idea in the morning. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, same question, you know, who, who is, has trouble keeping up with technology? Anyone just hands up? <laughs> me too, me too, seriously. Uh, uh, I'm terrible at it, and it's part of my job, so that's a problem. Uh, but uh, but that's, that's, not just, uh, that's not just your fault. I mean, tech, tech learning is currently broken, like we were talking about. I don't want to you know, rehash, but, uh, you know, the technology advances so fast that even if you get individual skills, they're quickly outdated, and it's up to you usually to keep... Uh, to keep learning, to keep you know, keep improving, and oftentimes there's not support to do that. Depends on what service, what tool you're using. Maybe you've got annual conferences. Maybe you got to figure it out on your own. But that's not the only problem. Organizational knowledge is incomplete. For those of you who put your hands up about the tools that you were using earlier, there's a good chance that wherever you go after this, your boss is going to have no idea what it is you're doing. Uh, like really, they're going to be like, plug it in, make some magic happen, give me some statistics, and then you know, we'll go with that. I mean, make a pretty, you know, make a pretty map. And then, uh, and then we'll, we'll use it. Uh, and that, that's a problem because these tools are basically being handicapped into what people think is a, is a good role uh, based on that incomplete knowledge because they could be bothered to learn what it is you do. And so, you know, we need to have, you need to have a system where the, the, the techies are talking to program managers, are talking to the funders, are talking, and also, most importantly, this part gets left out, talking to people will be affected by the policies. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the frequency with, with which programs are conceived, executed, and then uh, evaluated without ever asking anyone if they want a program uh, who's going to be affected with it is, is staggering. And so uh, that, that organizational knowledge is, is something that needs to be taken into account um, also in terms of where it's going. Um, and so, you know, th but before it was hard. It was, you know, it's expensive. The world's a big place. Who do you contact? Everything's online now, so if your excuse is just being lazy. And the last one is uh, learning networks are undeveloped. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the hardest part is not necessarily taking a class or doing a workshop for your work. It's creating a network where you can keep learning successfully and going, I have no idea what I'm doing. What are you doing? Okay, that sounds great. Um, and a lot of those happen, you know, same deal. Bars, workshops, conferences, hackathons, whatever it is you're doing. Um, but a lot of those are informal, and there's not really a persistent, good platform that's out there that says, it's okay, you don't know what you're doing. Neither do we, but we're going to connect you with some guys who, who know their stuff. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that doesn't exist yet. There's a couple different models. I mean, we... Uh, we talked about teaming up with tech. Um, one of the challenges we have tech change, we do online We do online teaching, we also have to do online learning. I, I'm currently in three different uh, online courses on three different platforms, uh, behind the two of them, but don't tell anyone. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's, but the point is that, that that system is very fragmented, and oftentimes you know, you've got to go to multiple sources. So uh, we try to solve this through a couple different ways. We do interactive classes uh, that we try to do in, in, in university settings, and, uh, and part of that is also we get, try to get beyond um, uh, teaching about a tool and start teaching people to use a tool. And, and that's a very different approach because you're not just being like, here it is theoretically. We're like, here, it's in your hands. Here's a problem. Here's your team. Go. You know, don't ask me any questions. I want you to try a couple times. And if you're having a problem in 15 minutes, then we'll be here. And, you know, like, you know, like throw people in. Make them learn. And sometimes you'll be surprised. They'll come up with creative solutions that you didn't anticipate. And so that's, that's kind of a core point uh, that we like to do. And uh, this was actually a training they did yesterday. Um, there, there's our zombie outfits. It's uh, uh, this was, I think, a Yushi, yeah, this was Yushihidi training uh, that they did at uh, was it a uh, GW? Yeah. Okay, George Washington University. Um, and um, it's fun. We try to make you know fun, have a laugh. But the reason why we're actually using uh, zombie masks is that um, uh, we used to do this on malaria, and the problem is is that we had a class full of health experts in sub-Saharan Africa, and everything ended up into a 20-minute argument about, no, 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 that's not me. No, no, no. And, uh, and so, and then we actually kind of realized, we're like, well, we don't actually want to teach people wrong, you know, how to, how to do this. Um, so, so we tried to switch to a made-up disease where people have fewer compulsions and also set, a, set an area of fun, you know, like, it's, it's fine. And it's where you get, um, you get people, you know, letting their hair down, 
having fun, learning about a tool, and not being afraid to look silly. I mean, you're like, we're, we're you're like, seriously, this, this guy, he did uh, during the training in, in Kenya, he's, he's, he's amazing, he's got both that, that rare combination of programmer and, uh, and, uh, and education skills, and here he is prancing around a mosque, man in a mask, uh, handing out cards and, and you know, brains. Uh, so when you, when you start that way, I think it creates a much more fun and accessible learning environment that can focus on the tool. Uh, and on that note, that's not just limited to individual trainings, we also try to do uh, professional training. So this was, uh, this is actually the same Jordan, it's Ami Jordan. Uh, this is United, we were invited by UNDP uh, to come up and speak at the National Peace Institute to look at uh, crowdsourcing for conflict prevention. And um, we did a very similar thing where we were, we were trying to teach you know, not just individuals how to use it, but organizations how to approach it. And I assure you, we were very, very serious and professional. We went with Godzilla, uh, an attack on New York. Uh, and so, and then the idea being that we wanted to do the same sort of thing. And uh, you never know how it'll go, a bunch of room full of you know, people in suits. Uh, you know, your, your boss's boss's boss, boss in most cases. And, uh, and they ate it up. They had a great time. Um, so similar, similar sort of idea, looking at an organizational approach instead of an individual skill approach. The last one, and this is my only fancy slide. You can tell I stole it from previous presentations, so it's out of date. Um, but uh, online learning. And so if you were trying to do a global education strategy, uh, if you've got to fly out there and do a workshop or do a class, you're, you're really going to be limited to who you can teach and, how, and who you can reach. Um, you know, it's expensive, it's hard. We're a tiny team, we're 10 people. You send three of us out somewhere for a week, and a lot of stuff's not going to get done. And so, yes, the transition worked. Okay. Um, so, this is, we've, uh, we've currently got uh, online classes that we've uh, been doing since last September. We have over 400 students in over 70 countries. Uh, great response rates. We've only had one unsatisfactory response. I'm going to stop mentioning that because that guy came around at the end, but it still counts, so it's still on the record. Um, but uh, uh, the, main, the main point being that if we were to try to reach all these people in September, uh, it would cost a ton of money, take a ton of time. It would be really, really hard to do. Uh, but since we've, we've built an online platform that's, that can handle that sort of scale and hopefully maybe not provide a comparable level of, of you know, it's, not, it's never going to replace person-to-person -person contact. But you can try to bring the best of you know, uh, social contact and, and direct teaching with sort of the online abilities that you're going to have as an online platform and do the best you can to just like make it scalable, make it, make it effective. Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is great. I mean, these aren't just you know, slices of faces. This is, this is, we, we can't show you all of those because we don't have full permission. This one we do. Um, but this is, this is one of the students we had in Pakistan. This is Talha bin Tariq. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he took a class with us. And this is, uh, when you're talking about online learning, it sounds very scary. You say, like, oh, yes, you know, you've got all this hard stuff you got to do. You've got to have all these other things. No, this is, are you going to this computer? He's taking this class. He's got a platform up behind him. I can show you if I don't steal out all of Rob's time. Our current class, will that be all right? Pull it up. Okay, I'll pull it up right after this. But uh, the, uh, uh, if this can work in Pakistan, it can work anywhere. I mean, we had regular load shedding during this month. We did a class on uh, online offline organizing uh, on behalf of IRIX. Uh, for the Global U grad alumni who are basically international exchange students. And uh, if it works here, if this guy, if, seriously, if Talha can do this on his notebook uh, in, in, uh, anyway, in, in, in Pakistan, uh, it'll work. It'll work anywhere. And so the idea that this is something that's far out there that's not going to work, that you'll be very careful about, um, we definitely be careful about. But I mean, but that you have to uh, have a high level of expertise or connectivity to do. Is nonsense. I mean, we, we also do classes in Sudan. We can show you, you know, you can see from the map, these are not necessarily the best connected areas. I mean, a minimum level is there, but it's a lot less than you think. So, and now Rob Baker, but I want to just show you real quick. Can I open it? Oh, this is so rude. All right. No, no. Is that it? No. Oh, this is bad. Okay, here we go. So, this is, this is our current class that we're doing for mobile. For mobiles. And oh, this looks terrible on the big screen. But here's our members. You know, Denver, here, here you go, Matt. Denver, is Matt here? No. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> so, he's losing points for that one. <laughs> he's losing yeah, points. I think so. We, we, gave, we gamify the system. We try to make it fun. Same principles apply. You know, Kenya, Liberia, uh, Cape to Amsterdam. I mean, you know, this is... Patrick and his wonderful scowl, I know of uh, uh, Nigeria. But I mean, I think this is, this is part of the idea. It's not just that they're on, you know, and theoretically, I mean, these are people who are online. You can chat with them, you can talk with them, you can reach out to them. And, uh, and so you can learn together, but you also have that access to a global community in this classroom setting. And so that's, uh, uh, I'm going to stop hogging rocks across time, but uh, it's not, uh, there's no excuse not to be doing it. 